you to turn to the 20th chapter of Luke's Gospel. As, uh, today we'll look at the last few verses of Luke 20 and the beginning of Luke 21 as we inch our way closer uh, to finishing Luke's Gospel. And I'm thankful again that Pastor Nick was able to uh, share from God's Word from Daniel with you last Lord's Day. And now we'll return to Luke's Gospel where I remind you that uh, we're in the final days of Jesus leading up to the cross. And we find Jesus preaching on the temple grounds, and as he is preaching there, uh, he is being questioned uh, by Pharisees and scribes and other religious leaders, but uh, we've seen these were not sincere questions, uh, but they were questions in an effort to trick him, or as Luke tells us in verse 20, uh, or excuse me, he tells us in this passage, uh, that they were just trying to catch Jesus in something he said meaning they wanted him to contradict himself. They, they wanted him to expose himself for who they perceived him to be. And they did not perceive him to be the Lord's Messiah. Therefore, uh, they perceived him to be a liar or a fraud. They perceived him to be uh, a threat to their power that they had. And so long before this, they had been intent on destroying him. And the plan for his destruction is in place. Negotiations are being had with those among whom even follow him. Uh, but they're still trying to quest him in something, or catch him in something he might say, and, and their efforts fail because every time they try to ask Jesus one of these questions to, to catch him, to expose him, uh, they end up exposing themselves. Uh, they end up exposing who Jesus truly is, the Lord's Messiah, and in turn he exposes who they are, sinners in need of repentance those who proclaim to know the word of God and yet are not living according to it and are even very ignorant of it, as Jesus has pointed out. And so now they've come to the point in verse 40 where Luke tells us they no longer dare to ask him any question. <laughs> but Jesus is not done with them. That They're ready to walk off the field. They That they believe his destruction is in place, but there's still time on the clock. And, and the time that Jesus has He's going to use these opportunities to continue to expose sin, call people to repentance, and call them to follow him. And we see him do that very thing in this passage today. And so we're going to look at Luke chapter 20, uh, verses 45 through the beginning of, our, of chapter 21, verse 4. And out of reverence for God's word, if you're able to, I want to invite you to stand as I read this passage for us. And this is what the word of God says. But in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive a greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins, and he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. If you would pray with me, please. Father, we pray that we might hear from the riches of your word today and recognize our own poverty. <laughs> because we can have all the money in the world and be the poorest soul that ever existed. Help us, Lord, to see the, the, the richness, the, the, the treasure of the gospel of the kingdom that we might understand what it truly means to come to you, not in an effort to cover our sin ourselves, but to have our sin exposed and to trust in you to cover it through the blood of our Lord Jesus. Help us to recognize today the hypocrisy of our hearts and how easy it is for us to, to, to come in each Lord's day and to try to cover ourselves with some type of external righteousness, but, but never deal with the poverty of sin that exists within us, Lord. Help us to hear the gospel today and to respond to it in repentance and faith. 
and to pray that others might do the same. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Not long ago, I came across a, an article that was talking about one of the deadliest months in the history of our deadliest national park, the Grand Canyon. You have likely seen over the years how every once in a while there'll be some type of accident at the Grand Canyon. Someone will fall into the canyon. In fact, uh, the Grand Canyon National Park averages about 12 deaths per year. But uh, this article looks specifically at what they refer to as one of the deadliest months in the history of this national park as four people lost their lives in just a matter of a few weeks. It all began when the body of a Japanese tourist was found in the forest south of Grand Canyon Village. And then just a couple of days later, a male tourist from China fell 100 feet into the canyon while taking photos near the edge. And several days after that, a 67-year-old man from California died after also falling from the edge. And then, not even two weeks later, a 70-year-old woman fell to her death. And this article tried to examine why is it that more of these deaths are happening because they are picking up in faith. And why so many in a month? And in the article, they interviewed a park ranger who said this. He said, we rangers continually warn tourists of the danger and signs are posted along the edge, but everyone ignores the risk. And he went on to talk about how uh, there's more and more signage, there, there's more and more warnings, there's articles being written, there's social media being flooded saying, stay away from the edge, warning, this is deadly, and this is serious. And yet, as they went on to describe in the article, we live in a social media age, an age of selfies, and, and more and more people just completely ignore these warnings as they back themselves up to the edge to take what ends up being the last picture they will ever take, all because they refuse to heed a warning. <laughs> well, we're not visiting the Grand Canyon this morning, but we are coming to the Word of God where we see Jesus give yet another warning. And this is a warning, not all that different than a warning he's given before. You may remember in our study of Luke, we looked at Luke chapter 12, where Jesus gave a warning to the Pharisees, and he said to, to, to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And while warning them, he's warning his followers, don't be like them. Don't take the leaven of the Pharisees, something that might come in and rot and spread. And what is that leaven? He says it is hypocrisy. In fact, often we see in the gospel accounts, Jesus specifically calls out hypocrisy, hypocrites, those who put on some type of external covering thinking that the internal will not be exposed. And it is this sin of hypocrisy that Jesus will give another warning concerning, as he says here in this text, beware of the scribes. And then he goes on to describe their hypocrisy. Not only describe it, we see this, and it's the first observation in your outline. We see, number one, that Jesus condemns hypocrisy. And now, again, we, we, we've seen Jesus here uh, being what people perceive to be led into some type of trap, but, but Jesus knowingly walks in there to the temple to ground, and, and he, rather than being exposed for what they think he is, exposes who he really is, and at the same time exposes their sinful hearts. And here, he's exposing the sin of hypocrisy in the scribes, and in doing that, he's given a specific warning to his disciples. And friends, in doing this, Jesus isn't just speaking to a sin that existed 2,000 years ago. <laughs> he's speaking to a sin that exists today. He's speaking to a sin we struggle with today. He's speaking to a sin it might be a core part of your life and my life today, the sin of hypocrisy. Because it is so easy for us to walk around and to present ourselves as one thing and at the same time be terrified that people might find out who we truly are, that the sin in our hearts, something dark that no one knows about, something we think we can hide from others and even we think we can hide somehow from God. And yet in this hypocrisy, we find a path to destruction 
the path of condemnation. And so Jesus, in his grace, in the final minutes on the clock now, he will once again call our attention to this sin that we might repent of it. And he does this by pointing to an illustration which is right there in front of him, the scribes. He says about these scribes, beware of the scribes. Don't be like them. How are they? Verse 46, he says, well, here's what their hypocrisy looks like. They, they walk around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplace. Hey, he's describing here how the scribes adorn themselves in these hand-tailored white silk robes that were embroidered with all kinds of colorful religious symbols. And now initially, these robes were worn traditionally at religious festivals, but by the time we get to Jesus' day in Luke chapter 20, we find the scribes now wearing these as everyday garments <laughs> because they wanted attention. And in fact, they enjoyed the attention so much at these religious festivals, they thought, well, we can just wear these around in the marketplace. And then people will revere us and honor us. It was an external symbol of their importance in society and their religious zeal. And so while others might walk around the marketplace and say, oh, shalom, Eli, oh, shalom, Levi, they would receive these great honoring greetings. Oh, shalom, most righteous and holy and devout, Zechariah. Oh, we're so honored with your presence today that you might come into our marketplace, that you might come to my, my lowly fruit stand. Oh, thank you for blessing us with your presence. <laughs> Not all that different than how I'm greeted at Bart Smart when I have on my wedding suit. It's very different. <laughs> but you can see how this might boost one's ego, how this might build one up. And the scribes loved it. In fact, Jesus says they, they walked around this way. They, they loved these greetings. He says in verse 46, they loved the best seats in the synagogue. Now, the way the synagogue was arranged is there would be a, a central place up front where the teaching would come from, where a, a rabbi, a visiting teacher would come and would speak. And then located behind them would be a series of chairs. And these chairs were reserved for people like the scribes. And these were the best seats in the synagogue because they perceived them to be the seats closest to the scroll where the word of God was read from. It was symbolically saying to the people, here are the men who are closest to God. They loved the best seats. They would get there early just to get them. Much like some of you did in the balcony this morning. You know, want to make sure you got those great seats in the balcony, those great seats in the dugouts. Very different in the synagogue. They were right up front. In fact, they were right here behind the teacher because they wanted to present themselves as holy and righteous. Luke tells us, verse 46, they love places of honor at the feast. And so you might imagine uh, going to a wedding reception, and I'm sure most of in this room have, have attended one maybe not that long ago, and, and you walk into that wedding reception, and perhaps there's some type of kiosk or, or board there that tells you, well, you know, Carwell family, you're at table 49, and you look up your place, and you want to figure out how, how far away or how close it is to the buffet table in the bathrooms, and, and then you see from table 49... Way up front there, there's the, the head table, the family table. Those chairs are empty, and you know why they're empty, because there's going to be a procession. There's going to be an announcement. The bride and the groom and the bridal party and the groomsmen are going to come in, and they're going to sit at that table of honor, and then there'll be family seated nearby. Those were the places of honor. So if these scribes will walk in, they would expect to see their name beside table number one. They would expect to be at the table of honor. And they would be given that seat because of their prestige and their perceived righteousness because of their external things they wore, because of the role that they played as experts in the law of God. And Jesus points this out. He says they, they, they love this. They love how people look at them. They love how people treat them. And and then notice what he says in verse 47. Not something they love, but something they do. He says, they devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, they make long prayers. 
Now, this might require a little historical understanding to understand what Jesus is saying here. The, the, the scribes in their day were legal experts. They were experts in the law of God, which was the law of the Jewish people. And so they were consulted and paid by the people for their legal counsel. But tradition held that they could not charge certain people. And one of those categories of people were the widows. And in fact, among all the cultures of that day, it was only the people of God that were taught, you are to honor the widow, you are to take care of the widow, because so many took advantage of the widow, which is why we see Jesus using widows in parables to talk about those who were taken advantage of. Remember the parable of the widow and the unrighteous judge. It's a case just like that. She's being taken advantage of. There's no one to speak on her behalf. And so God told his people, you're to speak on their behalf. You're to care for them. So with the scribes, they were to offer their legal services, their legal counsels to the widows. They weren't to charge from it. But we know from what Jesus tells us about the scribes, we know from what's recorded in the Gospels, that the Pharisees, the scribes, so many of these religious leaders in this day, they loved money. They loved prominence. They loved things. They loved stuff. You know, it took money to buy these long silk robes. <laughs> It took money to have them embroidered with all these religious symbols. It took money to buy a seat on that platform. And so when it came to the widows, they could not charge, but they, they, they figured out a way to make themselves wealthy off the widow. Because part of their legal counsel would often be to the widow, well, you, you have this money in an estate from your husband, this money that's for you, this money that you are to pass on to your children one day, we're, we're the experts in this area. Let, let us manage this for you. Let us take this burden off you. Let, let us take care of you and make sure you're taken care of. And so oftentimes, the widow would just pass over those assets to these scribes, these holy men, because they were the ones close to God, and, and they were trying to help out. And all the while, they would take this money and use it for themselves. In fact, we know from history that they would even tell these widows that they would love to pray for them. I mean, love to pray for specific prayer requests. And, and if there was just a donation given, that would ensure a prayer. And the greater the donation, the longer the prayer. One pastor noted they weren't praying for them, they were praying on them. Not so different from what we see today, is it? I mean, there's no shortage of televangelists still, which now we can just go and see them on the internet, so internet evangelists, I guess, whatever that word might be, but they're, they're, they make the same promises, don't they? If you'll just send in your seed of faith, if you'll just send in this gift, now listen, it doesn't matter what you got in your bank account. It doesn't matter if you've got anything or not. It doesn't matter if you've got enough money to cover that check. You just send that check right in. And our prayer team, in fact, I personally will make sure that we pray for you. And so whatever it is that you're asking the God, God to bless you with, make sure you let us know that, and we'll pray specifically for that. And here's a testimony from brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so who came into great wealth because they sent in their seed gift. Not that long ago, you may have seen, as I did, a, a special report on one of the news specials about one such televangelist who gave such a plea and and when an undercover investigation took place with hidden cameras they found rooms full of letters simply open to take the dollars and the checks out and thrown into a pile to be put in the dumpster not just requests that were never prayed for requests that were never read jesus is giving us a picture of that here in these uh, scribes they, they devour widows houses and for a pretense, they make long prayers. Jesus is saying, these scribes, like many of us, they're a bunch of hypocrites. And we've talked about hypocrite before, where that word comes from. It goes back to theater. It goes back to one who was an actor, one that would put on a mask. They would pretend to be someone they were not. And they put on quite a performance. And friends, we're tempted to do that very thing each and every Lord's Day. 
where we're tempted to come in here and make a performance, where, where we're tempted to, to talk and act and present ourselves in such a way, all the while hoping that nobody really knows what went on this week, what was before our eyes, the thoughts that went through our minds, the sins that we are so easily entangled in. That, Jesus says, is the hypocrite. He doesn't say the hypocrite is one that doesn't sin. He says the hypocrite is the one who seeks to cover up their sin on their own. And in this case, with a cover of external perception of righteousness. And notice what Jesus says will come to those like this. Verse 47, he says, they will receive a greater condemnation. Now just consider that for a moment. The, the wages of sin is death. That's sufficient. <laughs> When, when Jesus speaks of hell and Sheol and Hades, when the, when the scripture speaks of the consequence of sin, it's sufficient. But when we read in the garden that Adam and Eve rebelled against God and God removed them from the garden and said death would come, it's sufficient. And yet what does Jesus say here? They will receive a greater condemnation. Do you hear what Christ is saying? There's a special place in hell for hypocrites. That's essentially what he's saying. He says their condemnation will be great. The question we should ask is why? I mean, Jesus calls all sin out. That there are no sin in the scripture that God whispers about. All sin is sin. All sin is deserving of condemnation. The wages of sin... All of it is death. But there are times we see our Lord Jesus in his interaction with sinners respond differently to their sin. Always condemns it. Always calls it sin. But times there, there's elements we see that are just, just different in the way he treats them and in his interaction with them. And so you think about in Luke's gospel, Jesus' interaction with the tax collectors and, and his interaction with the prostitutes and his interaction with those that society perceived to be sinners and even who understood they were sinners. They weren't pretending to be something they weren't. Jesus still calls them a sinner. What does he say to a sinful woman? Go and sin no more. And he doesn't say, well, your sin's not that big a deal. You, you know what? There's others to blame for what's happened to you. This really isn't your fault at all. No, he says, go and sin no more. Repentance is a word for what Jesus says. Turn from your sin, turn to the Lord. This is how God deals with sin. This is how Jesus deals with sin. But when we look at these interactions with the tax collector and others, we, we see his grace and his mercy. Turn from your sin, turn to me. And yet here, with the scribes, he says, let me describe these folks to you, these folks who are listening. Luke tells us, he says this to his disciples, in the hearing of all, who else is there? The Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and others who've been trying to catch Jesus and saying the wrong thing. And in their presence, he says to them, there's a special place in hell for you. Why is that? Well, why does our Lord speak in such harsh terms about the hypocrite? And I, I, my opinion is this. I think it's because Hypocrisy is the sin that keeps you from acknowledging that you're a sinner. Hypocrisy is the sin of seeking to cover up your sin by not even acknowledging that it is sin. Hypocrisy is the sin of thinking, my covering is sufficient. My perception of external righteousness is sufficient. So when I sin, when I feel guilty of that sin, no need to even think about it a moment longer because look at all the great things I'm doing over here. And yeah, somebody might see this, so let me just do this to cover it. Let me put on this long silk robe. Let me put on this uh, seat at the table. Let me be honored in the marketplace. And therefore, the world will not see what I've actually seen and what I can actually cover this sin of thinking that we can cover our sin. And it's hypocrisy. And it begins in the garden with Adam and Eve, who disobey God, 
who sinned, and what did they do in response to their sin? Did they plead to God? Did they call out to God? Did they say, we, we are wrong, we disobeyed you, have mercy on us, God? No, they, they go and get fig leaves and they sew them together. And what do they do? They seek to cover themselves. <laughs> and that covering wasn't sufficient for them and it's not sufficient for these scribes and it's not sufficient for us today because Jesus has come to deal with our sin, but the first step in dealing with our sin is to expose our sin. And, and to understand what the hypocrite does not, that there's no use pretending. Because while we can fool everybody around us, we cannot fool God. Because God knows our hearts. And that's where we go next. The second observation here. Jesus here shows. He, he knows our hearts. And some of you years ago may have read Milton's Paradise Lost. And so you may remember when he says, Neither men nor angels can discern hypocrisy. The only evil that walks invisible except to God. <laughs> it's easy for us to walk around as complete hypocrites. And for nobody to recognize it, we need to understand this because so often when we speak of hypocrites in our culture today, we speak of those who, for the most part, people recognize as hypocrites. Look at that hypocrite. In fact, that, that news program I was referring to where that televangelist is exposed, I remember the news anchor says, what a hypocrite. <laughs> you invite somebody perhaps to come to church with you, they say to you, I, you know, I'm, I'm good with God, and I don't go to the church because the church is full of hypocrites. Where we're used to hypocrisy being referred to as something that everybody sees, but what we see here in the Scripture is Jesus is pointing to hypocrisy as something that people don't actually recognize. That's why he's calling it out. That's why the warning signs are being put up here. That's why he's telling his disciples, beware the scribes, don't be like the scribes. Why? Because he knows the threat before them is to be like the scribes. I mean, they're his disciples. Now, the day will come, not so many days from this, when Christ will be crucified and Christ will be raised and people will be in hurry about these miraculous things. And then will be the day of Pentecost where, where thousands will hear the gospel in their own native tongue and then the, the church will begin to grow and then in that the church will get a reputation among some and then many will want to come and be a part of this. And the temptation is there for Christ's followers <laughs> to start considering themselves more important than they are. To start perhaps at the same time while they're struggling with sin to seek to cover that sin with this reputation. In fact, it is the reputation that they need to keep up, lest their sin be exposed. We have to understand here, we can fake it in front of everybody else, but we can't fake it before God. And so we have paired together, and I think intentionally by Luke, this scene where he is, in the hearing of all the people, saying to his disciples, beware of the scribes, don't be a hypocrite, watch out for hypocrisy. And then just after this, as we turn to chapter 21, we have Jesus, I believe, right there at that time on the temple grounds, observing an example of both hypocrisy and of humility, of what he's calling them away from and what he's calling them to. And he shows us in this how he knows our hearts. So here Luke tells us that Jesus, as he's teaching on the temple grounds, he he turns to this scene where people are making an offering. They're putting their gifts into an offering box. And we know this to be historically an area there on the temple grounds where there were 13 offering boxes, and each of them uh, had, had a title, a label on them, that indicated where this offering would go to. Uh, some were, you know, perhaps for the you know, keeping up the temple grounds, and others would be just free will offerings, and others might go to offset the cost of these temple sacrifices for people who might not be able to afford them. But but they were seen as a gift, someone going above and beyond their normal giving. They would go by these offering boxes, and you can look historically at pictures of these offering boxes, and, and what you see of them is a large trumpet shape coming up out of the box where people would drop their coins in. So, so they didn't just kind of put it in a slot. They put it in this large metal trumpet opening. 
when, when I saw pictures of it, I couldn't help but think about what we used to see when we used to go to malls, there would be uh, these donation boxes in the malls, and they often had kind of a, a trumpet shape to them where you could put in the coin and it just spin around in circles and circles, and, and you wanted to get it to spin as much as you could before it clinked in the bottom, and and maybe you did what we did with our kids. They, you know, One put one on this side, another, they'd race those coins around, and it could turn into quite a spectacle. Everybody walking by would notice. Well, you can imagine the scene here. There's no bills. There's no checks. There's no Venmo. There's, there's coins. And coins were measured by their weight and the material made for them. And this is what gave them their value. And so you had people with, with these gold coins that were worth a, a month's wages. You had others who would have a denarii. We've seen a denarii throughout the gospel accounts. That was worth about a month's wages. So, so about 25 of them would get to that gold coin and, and so on and so forth. And so during this Passover time, when, when you have thousands of people coming through the temple grounds, when you have pilgrims coming from all over, there's, there's a measure of honor and prestige in going by these offering boxes and, and dropping your coin in. And maybe if you're really skilled, you could do it such a way where it kind of spun around and clunked around and everybody could hear it. And I'm sure there were those folks kind of watching from the sidelines and they could perceive with their ears, oh, that was a gold coin. Well, look at him. God truly blessed him. Remember, so many viewed external wealth as a sign of God's blessing in this day. Somebody else would walk by. I didn't even barely hear that. <laughs> they, they were measured by what they gave. And without even seeing it, people could hear it. Now, that's the scene here. And Luke tells us that Jesus looks up during this Passover celebration and first, he notices the rich putting their gifts in the offering box. And again, as the rich put their offering in, I think he's calling us right back to who he just described in the, scri described in the scribes. Okay, he's speaking of those who wore their righteousness externally. He's speaking of those who would make sure everybody heard that gift going in. And so maybe they would take that gold coin and they would exchange it for 25 denarii because, you know, 25 coins going in sounds a lot greater than one coin going in. Maybe they'd slip a gold coin in there with it so it might sound like 25 gold coins are going in. They want to make sure people hear. They want to make sure people perceive. And yet, notice the comparison he gives. He looks up and sees the rich giving their gifts. And then he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Now these coins were known as lepta. Now that word literally means shavings or peelings. And so you can see what that implies. That this was the, the thinnest, tiniest coin in circulation in Jesus' day. And it was about the size of a small button on your shirt. It was barely noticeable. It could easily be dropped from the hand. It might be something like we think of a penny today where somebody drops it in the parking lot and they don't even bend over to pick it up. Why? Because they view it as virtually worthless. This is what this poor widow gave. In fact, by today's standards, a isn't even worth a penny. It's worth about one-tenth of a penny. <laughs> And so here we have someone giving about 20% of a penny into this offering box. Nobody would notice this. And yet Jesus does. And we might ask the question, why? Well, why is Jesus calling attention to something that has no value in his culture? I mean, it'd be one thing if perhaps somebody came up and they made a, a great gift and they did it sincerely. And, and Jesus says, listen, now there's a person with a sincere heart. There's a person with a sacrificial gift. Be more like Mr. So-and-so. But Jesus here points out this poor widow and notice what he says of her. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them for they all contributed out of their abundance. Meaning that they had so much, more than they needed. 
All their needs were met, and they still had plenty left over. So they went over to the leftover pile. <laughs> yeah, they went in the refrigerator on Wednesday and pulled out the leftovers from Sunday. Something they could just throw out, something they could disregard, but they give it as a gift because they had so much, they knew that even their leftovers were greater than many people's sacrificial gifts. They do this in a way much like the scribes to bring attention to themselves. And Jesus notices it and he calls it out. He says they contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty gave all that she had to live on. And there's something here, and you can you can spend more time looking at this and looking at the call to humility, but there's there's a picture here. And it's not just a picture that we pursue humility, it's a picture of our understanding of God's sovereignty and that God knows and that God sees. And even those little shavings the size of buttons thrown in that may not have made a noise going in, Jesus sees because Jesus sees everything. And the reality, the hypocrisy is this. We tend to recognize our sin, but see it like a shaving, a button size shaving. We tend to minimize our sin. We tend to think little of our sin. We, we tend to excuse our sin and diminish our sin and think, well, don't nobody will even notice this. Others are far worse than me. At least I'm not like so-and-so. Well, God knows. And God sees. And God calls us to turn and to repent. And when he calls us to repentance, he calls us finally to this, a third and final observation. He calls us to give our lives to him. And I think that's a, a principle we can draw from this passage as well. Luke, Luke makes sure to note that Jesus says, they contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Do you see that? She, she, she's not just giving less and the percentage is the same because, you know, she doesn't have so much. So she'll just give this percentage, which is a lot less than the person who has much giving their percentage. He says these two little button-sized coins, these shavings of metal, these barely discernible less than a penny that she throws in, it's all she had. It's the only thing she had to live on. I would imagine in our context, in our culture today, we would say, here, take, take, take that back. You, you, you shouldn't be giving that. It's all you had. I had a friend years ago that discipled me as I was a new believer at North Carolina State. He, he was a staff member with Campus Crusade, and I remember uh, you know, he and his wife, they, they, they raised support. They weren't wealthy people. I mean, the church they were members of was having a building program. They were calling people in the congregation to give sacrificially, to give graciously. And he never shared this story, but I found out from others. He did not boast of it, but that they just didn't have much. And so that Sunday when the offering plate came around, they took off their wedding rings and put them in. It's what they had. Somebody later bought the rings and gave them back to them. And so then they gave them again. <laughs> it's what they had. It's all they had. And we might look at that today and say, well, no, no, you, you keep that. Somebody else can take care of that. But, but do you see what Jesus is saying here? Jesus doesn't need the gold coin. Jesus doesn't need anything. Everything we have is by God's giving and God's gifting. It's all his. Everything. And when we give, we, we aren't adding to God's bank account in some way. He's not sitting in heaven after each Lord's Day, turning to the Son at the right hand saying, well, how do we do today, Son? Everything you have is His. He calls us to be stewards of it. And part of stewardship, a fundamental part of stewardship, is understanding that we need to trust God because our temptation is not to trust Him. And in not trusting Him, what do we do? We, we hold on and we hoard and then as those piles grow, we say, oh, okay, well, I can give off the top here. What does this woman do? No, she says, I'm letting go. It's all his. Here you go. She, she is completely trusting God. And I don't think this is just a financial lesson. I think there's a greater lesson here because it goes back to the big picture. The, the, the scribes were hypocrites. They, they didn't trust God. They trusted themselves. They weren't going to bring their sin before God. They were going to cover it with external righteousness. This woman, she's trusting God. She's giving everything to him. 
And, and I wonder today, friends, if we are, if we're doing the same. I wonder which of those two represents us best. Are we just kind of skimming off the top? Or are we bartering and bargaining with God like a, a child in the night of Halloween? They go back with all their candy. Well, you, yeah, Dad, you, you can have this. I'm going to keep these. And Mom, you can have this. I'm going to keep this. I bought the costume. In fact, half that candy I, I gave to you all week long. It's all mine to begin with. <laughs> Who are you to keep it back? Yet that's what we so often do with God. That's our attitude towards the Father. Well, this, this is mine and mine and mine. I'm like, you can have that little bit over there. No, Jesus is saying it's all his. And why would we not come before him and trust in him? So, friend, are, are you trusting in him today? Not, not just with a few categories. Are you trusting him with everything? With, with your life and your job and your finances and your health and your your family, and those, those, those hard things that you want to fix on your own and you want to hold on to you on your own and you're scared to death by really let go of this. What, what's going to happen to it? I, I've got to do this. I've got to be in control. Now, Jesus says we need to relinquish control and we need to trust in him, and I pray that we'll do that today. If you would, pray to that end with me. Let's, let's stand and pray and respond now to God's word.